I want to thank you for joining in to our Bible study again this evening and want to encourage you to have your Bible open to John chapter 12 with me as we continue to study scriptural examples of generosity, selfless and sacrificial generosity. Tonight in John chapter 12, we encounter Jesus in a situation where he has ministered, he has gifted to a group of people. And we're going to watch this group of people respond to Jesus' gift to them as they interact with him in a dinner setting. One of the great aspects of the good news of the gospel is that it is a free gift. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. And we know that verse. We're aware of that phraseology, but we should probably meditate more on the fact that God gave Jesus. That was his gift. That eternal life is a gift through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who gave his life. The Apostle Paul speaks in his letters of counting it an honor, feeling that it was a privilege to give his life, to be poured out like a drink offering. The fact is we begin our life with Christ because of a generous gift. We have examples in the New Testament, such as Paul, of individuals who serve and see their life as a gift, a, an offering poured back out because of what Christ has done for them. And we're going to see that lived out in a very practical way. As I was studying, I made note of the fact that Jesus told 38 parables in the Gospels, 16 of which deal with money or material possessions. In the entire Bible, one wrote, there are just over 500 references to prayer, but there are more than 2,000 references to money and possessions. Now, I don't want to twist that and make it into something that it is not, but what I do want to communicate is that clearly tells us that money and material possessions are obviously important and big issues with God. They all, in effect, these verses and these parables, convey the reality that God owns everything. And the impetus of that emphasis is that very fact. God owns it. We're stewards of it. However, we don't really think about it as often as we should, practically speaking. What are we doing with what God has given to us? We live in a world where money matters, certainly. But there's not much emphasis in the world in which we live on giving whole lot of emphasis on getting, but not much on giving. Here in John chapter 12, as I've referenced, we're going to watch these people interact. We're going to sense, we're going to see their hearts. We're going to see an incredibly generous gift. I want to begin reading in verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead whom he raised from the dead. Now, that's a key integer. So we're meeting Lazarus, and we know that Jesus did something very specific and incredibly miraculous for Lazarus. He raised him from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. Now, obviously, Martha and Jesus had interacted. We've seen them interact over the passing of Lazarus and raising again. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So we're kind of reacquainted. We're reintroduced to some Bible characters that we know Jesus loved. We know that he loved Lazarus. We know that Jesus had done something for Lazarus and Martha and Mary. We know that Jesus had bestowed a miracle upon them. And what we see in this setting now is people interacting with Jesus based on what Jesus has done for them. They're 
they're now living life in the presence of Jesus with the awareness that Jesus has done something great for them. And we see Martha serving. That's what she can do. She's good at it. This is her gift. This is her heart. This is her possession, as it were. Now, Lazarus is seated at the table. So we think, well, Lazarus doesn't seem like perhaps he's the most thankful individual. Jesus raised him from the dead, and he's seated at the table. However, we read later on in John 12, in verses 10 and 11, this, But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because, get this, that by reason of him, that is Lazarus, many of the Jews went away, and believed on Jesus. Lazarus was witnessing. Lazarus was living to proclaim the truth about Jesus. Lazarus was expending his energy on telling his story, and people were believing. They were turning to Christ, turning away from religion, and turning to Jesus Christ. So we're watching these who have had something gifted to them from Jesus in turn interact with Jesus. Martha is serving. Lazarus is witnessing. And in verse 3, we find something striking. It's something I imagine you're familiar with. You know this story, but let's revisit it. Verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Did you note that John, in his Holy Spirit-inspired account, used two words, very costly? Now, that seems a strange thing to say in the midst of this narrative to point out that what she has just done with this ointment of spikenard, is very costly. So Martha has served, and Lazarus has witnessed, and now Mary does what she can with the possession, and it's pointed out to us that her gift was very costly. Now make no mistake about it. Martha is doing what she can, and it's making a huge difference. Lazarus is witnessing, and he's having such an impact that the Bible tells us the chief priests are consulting to try to kill him. His gift was costly too, just in a different way. But this is generosity. This is selflessness, not selfishness. She has given an extravagant gift, a pound of an ointment of spikenard poured on the feet of Jesus. And when this happens in the room, perhaps there was an audible gasp. We get a little insight in verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Here's the question that Judas asks. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. The moment that this case is broken, this box is broken, and this pound of ointment is used to anoint Jesus, Judas gasps, he has his eye on it, and what Judas sees is very different than what Mary sees. Judas sees a waste. Now, he sees it, and he makes the external comment, why didn't we sell that for 300 pence and give that 300 pence to the poor? And then John gives us the insight that the Holy Spirit allows him to see after the fact, and he says, that's not because Judas actually cared for the poor. He was a thief who wanted that expenditure in the bag so that he could line his own pockets. That's what it was. He saw a possession, and in seeing the possession, he thought to enrich himself. When Mary had the possession, and in line with how she viewed Jesus, saw an opportunity for selfless generosity and anointed Jesus with that. That is stark contrast. That is amazing contrast. 
He was upset that this treasure was in effect not given to his control so that he might do what he wanted with it when Mary was focused on giving up control of this very costly ointment for the sake of or back to Jesus. And that was extravagant. Extravagant is the right word. I appreciate what one author wrote. He said this, I'm a firm believer in saving, investing, intelligent spending, wise money management. He then said this, but I have trouble finding one word of scriptural support for being a tightwad. It isn't hard to spot them, he said. They all start with one main question. How much does it cost? And one main answer, we can't afford it. And one main criticism, we're spending too much money. I have yet, he said, to meet a Christian tightwad who knew by experience the first principle of enthusiastic faith. Never have I seen one who could dream broad dreams or see vast visions of what God can do in spite of man's limitations. He continued, I think this is interesting. Give me a handful of quote-unquote great hearts, generous open-handed, visionary, spiritually-minded givers, magnanimous giants with God who get excited about abandoning themselves to him. Give me that, he said. It's vision, vision, magnanimous, great faith, enthusiasm. That's what we sense from Mary, an awareness of what had been given to her and an abandonment of what she had to give back to Jesus. An enthusiasm lived out. Now, I tend to naturally be a bit of a tightwad. And I think sacrificial gifts are at every level. And I do think some of us are wired and gifted to be great givers, and others have to be decisive and willful and led of God, and then cheerfully settling on their obedience to God, participating in the gift. But it's all the same idea, an awareness of what has been given by God to us and responding with cheer and joy and enthusiasm in giving back to him selflessly, generously, magnanimously, extravagantly, sacrificially, and yet all of that happily. It's intriguing. Again, as I was studying, I saw that one said Mary anointed the body of Jesus six days before the Passover. She anointed the body of Jesus. He continued to say Mary of Bethany did not go to the tomb to anoint Jesus. In effect, she had given Jesus his anointing prior to his death. She did so while he was yet alive. This is ceremonial, what she's doing. She's anointing Jesus as the Messiah. But I want to focus for just a moment on the extravagance of her gift. She clearly loved Jesus. And Judas clearly loved himself. In fact, we'll see Judas betray Jesus for a really insignificant sum of money. It dominated him. It controlled him. He may not have been a wealthy man. He may have been traveling with Jesus. He may not have had a lot to his name, but yet possessions and money controlled him. I'm not saying that Mary lived a foolish existence or that she made bad financial decisions. I think what we just witnessed is her magnanimous, her joy-filled, her enthusiastic heart towards Jesus. And she had something special that she could give to him, and she broke the box. And I think that pivots us, and it asks us this question, what has God given me to give away back to him? What has God given you to give back to him? Now, I think this is an all-inclusive story, to be quite honest. Martha is serving. Lazarus is witnessing. Mary is giving a very costly gift. Jesus is surrounded by a group of disciples who have walked away from their livelihood, who will ultimately give their lives as martyrs for the cause of Jesus Christ. Jesus, seated there, will give his life. This is a room full of givers, save Judas. What is it that God has given you to give away? Because remember, as we started, 
God gave eternal life as a gift. Jesus gave. Paul viewed his life as an honorable, happy, joyful thing to give back to the Lord Jesus Christ. What has God given you? What has God given me? What am I giving away in response to what Jesus has done for me? Think about that. Meditate on that. Or do you somewhat, like we're all prone to at times, have the mindset of Judas? How can I keep this for myself? How can I enrich my existence? How can I be stingy with this? How can I advance my cause? Or is it to Jesus? Notice simply the effect. It was interesting when we read in verse 3, the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Matthew's account adds this in Matthew 26, 13. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told of a memorial of her. Jesus tells us this is going to be canonized. Where the gospel goes, this story will go. This house was filled with the ointment, and now the world is filled with this story. She wipes his feet with her hair. I thought this an interesting take. The house is filled with the ointment, which proves to us that this was not some small pinch of ointment, but rather this was breaking the box open. This was everything that the box contained. And then she wipes his feet with her hair and no doubt begins to move about the house and everywhere that she goes, she now carries that perfume, that ointment with her and it fills the house everywhere that she went with that smell. It impacted everyone in the room differently. Now, I know that Judas hypocritically wanted it sold to the poor so he could lie in his own pockets, but it would have been impossible for him to have been that close and not smelled the ointment. He was a partaker, as it were, in the extravagant gift of Mary because he's breathing it in. He knows the extravagance of this gift. And Jesus says this is canonized. This will, be, this will live beyond her years. This will have reach beyond this room where the ointment, beyond this house where the ointment has filled it with its beautiful odor. This will go on. This has eternal legs, as it were. This is how she will be remembered. She will be remembered for her selfless, extravagant generosity back to Jesus for what he had done for her. Stop and think about how you will be remembered. Now, again, wise money management is good. But will we be remembered for what we leave behind or will we be remembered for what we have given and laid up in store for that which is ahead? How will we be remembered? One wrote this, It is possible to know how to make a living and never experience life worth living. It is also possible to invest in eternal things and live life worth living. You do comprehend, as we've been studying on Sunday morning, that there is more than this. We'll enter into eternity. It is appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment, eternity awaits us. I think we underestimate the gifts. Jesus points us to it where you're treasure is, there will your heart be also. Lay up treasure where moth and rust don't corrupt and thieves don't break through and steal. There is the capacity to lay up in store for eternity. And I think that's what this is pointing to. This has legs beyond her life. This has legs beyond this house. How will we be remembered? What are we doing in light of eternity? You see, we're kind of back to where we started. God owns all of it. I know what it is to try to work to get ahead in life, and I know you do as well. I know what it is to want to have nice things, and, and we all probably desire that, and to try to better our existence and to do right by our family and to do right by our kids. 
I think we need to stop and truly understand who owns all of it. It's God. There came a point where Mary understood that having this pound, this ointment, really wasn't hers. It was God's. And she had the opportunity in this moment to give it to him physically, to literally expend it upon Jesus. That's a great blessing. And I think maybe we have it lost just a little. We think maybe in our day and in our age, we don't really have the opportunity that she had to bestow it upon Jesus. But that's not true. That's not good theology. We do give back to the Lord. He is aware of our gifts. They are measurable. He can see our faith. He owns it all. It's his Are we being stingy with it or are we being extravagant with it, generous with it? One said this, I think it great. She broke the container, the aroma of Christ, so honoring to him and so refreshing to others does not occur when we give him half our heart or half our pocketbook or half our talents or half our ambition or half our lives It comes by giving him everything. The impact of this gift was that she gave all of it. She humbly gave herself with no thought of her own glory. And as that smell permeated the house, she became a primary means of spreading the blessing. Spreading the blessing. Take what God has given to you, generously give it back and spread the blessing. Hopefully we comprehend that though we are chasing or pursuing what may seem to be a carnal end, that is a building, that it is something that will live beyond our years, expand beyond our gift. But far beyond that, it is obedience to the Lord and enthusiastic generosity, extravagant giving back to him that allows us to store up for eternity, which changes how we're remembered and allows us to store up treasures in heaven. This is a great story, watching people interact with Jesus, whom Jesus had done so much for. Martha served. Lazarus witnessed. Mary extravagantly gave. What are you doing with what God has given you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, for this account within the Gospels that we can study. We thank you for the gift of salvation. Help us now in these days to give back to you what you already own as good stewards. We thank you and ask your blessing on this week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening, and it's our prayer that you're helped by Pastor's Challenge on Generosity and Stewardship. If you can use some spiritual guidance or truly would like someone to pray for you, go ahead and reach out to us at Graceway. We'd love to join you in prayer and also partner with you in your spiritual walk. And you can do that by emailing us at info at gracewaycharlotte.org. June 4th is Victory Sunday, and we are looking forward to giving to the much-needed expansion of Phase 2. On Victory Sunday, we will take up our one-time Victory Sunday offering that will help Graceway launch the necessary first steps in the construction process. We will also turn in our 12-month commitments, and we pray that you will ask God for what your financial partnership would look like. We've seen God provide in miraculous ways, and we're looking forward to seeing how he will work in the days ahead. Vacation Bible School is right around the corner. All kids from K-4 through 5th grade are invited to join us on June 19th to June 21st from 6.30 to 8 o'clock each evening. We will be playing game show style games, picking prizes from a giant prize wall, singing songs, learning from God's word, and much more. All kids can register on our website at gracewaycharlotte.org. And if you would like to volunteer for this fun event, you could sign up on our website as well. June 17th is a Saturday, and we're going to have a VBS outreach. We'll gather here at the church at 10 a.m. and pass out flyers for VBS in the community around us. 
We hope you have a great week, and let's continue to connect others to our compassionate Savior. We'll see you now on Wednesday at 7 p.m.